Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Larry Coco, Director of Educational Technology for the New Jersey Department of Education, and this is the inaugural webinar by GAME, or Gamers Advancing Meaningful Education. GAME is an organization for educators who game, game, who want to learn how to game, and want to incorporate gaming strategies into teaching and learning. Tonight, we'll be talking about the use of World of Warcraft, or WOW, as we'll be calling it, in the classroom. We have a great group of panelists with experience in using WOW, other games and virtual environments in K-12, or higher education and also adult learning. A few technical notes before we start. Each of our panelists will speak in turn for about five minutes before we open things up to a general discussion and a Q&A session. You can ask questions or make comments in the live comments section on the right of your YouTube screen, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can during the actual broadcast. The session will be recorded and be available for on-demand viewing at the Games MOOC YouTube channel at the same link you use to access the live webinar. Some panelists will be showing live or recorded scenes from WOW. Please keep in mind that the image quality may degrade a little bit over YouTube, but we will be posting high-quality images via Flickr, and links to those images will be posted, posted in the description section of the recorded webinar. Now, I'll introduce the panelists in a minute. But first, I'd like to relate to you how I got involved with gaming and education. I consider the most important part of my job to be searching out ways to effectively use technology. It was pretty obvious to me from studies showing that over 90% of students play online or video games today, and also from my personal experience with my own children, that the great majority of students really enjoy gaming, and I always thought that it, that would be an effective way to create part of an educational environment. But it wasn't until, until fairly recently that learning science and research really began to show the value and effectiveness of game-like activities in education. I began to follow the work of Jimmy G, Jay McGonigal, Dr. Judy Willis, and others. And about a year ago, I was reading the book A New Culture of Learning by Douglas Thomas and John Seeley Brown. And I listened to Dr. Brown during a, a Steve Hargadon webinar. And he said that he considered World of Warcraft to be the most effective educational platform on the planet. And well, that sort of intrigued me. So what he said is that it's not because of the game itself, but it's because of the learning that happens in the fringe activities, where the players in preparing for their activities actually teach each other and collaborate and, and uh, uh, mentor each other on how to better succeed in the game. So I joined up, I started playing WoW, and quickly found it to be a very complex environment, and, and I, I uh, got my daughter, who's of college age and uh, a WoW enthusiast, to help me at first, and then I found Cognitive Dissonance, which is a guild of educators in WOW dedicated to the educational use of WOW. I joined up and I found that, um, you know, they, they use it in middle school, high school, college, uh, training activities, military training, all, all kinds of adult education, as well as K-12 and, and other educational activities. So now here we are, Cognitive Dissonance, with a diverse panel of educators and guild members ready to share our, our experiences and how to effectively use gaming and WOW in education. So our panelists, first of all, are Peggy Sheehy. Peggy is an instructional technologist at Suffern Middle School in Suffern, New York. Peggy's a true pioneer in the educational use of virtual worlds. In 2006, she established Ramapo Central's educational, educational presence in teen second life, Ramapo Islands. Suffern Middle School was the first middle school to use the virtual world for education. Peggy's latest passion is the use of games for learning, and she's now on a team spearheading the WOW in Schools project that incorporates World of Warcraft and standards-based learning. Her vision encompasses all now on a team spearheading the WOW in Schools project that incorporates World of Warcraft and standards-based learning. Her vision encompasses all learning that is student-centered, social, product-based, playful, and creative. She's also the acting guild master for Cognitive Dissonance, our educators' guild. And Peggy speaks frequently about WOW in school and educational gaming at conferences, including this year's ISTE conference. Our next panelist is Melody Collier. She has 16 years experience in education, both in the classroom and in administration. Currently, she is the state and federal programs district coordinator for Hawley Independent School District in Hawley, Texas. She has an extensive background in gifted and special education, testing and assessment, curriculum and instruction, as well as district policies and procedures for state and federal compliance. Uh, next is Chris Lukes. He's Associate Dean of Career and Technical Education at Colorado Community College System. 
and he's going to be showing us how he uses WOW to teach financial literacy at the college. Uh, Deborah Bakken has been involved with online gaming for 15 years. She has a master's degree in health education and soon will complete her second master's degree in nursing education. She's a nursing instructor at Asheville Buncombe Technol Technical Community College. And at school, Deb has become known as the instructor who likes to combine gaming with learning, and her students appreciate her methods as reflected in their positive course evaluations. Valerie Knoll is an instructional designer at Crew Training International in Omaha, Nebraska. She has 18 years experience designing and delivering training with a special focus on adult learning and military audiences. She designs instructions for instruction for the 55th Wing at Ofoot Air Force Base in Nebraska. And um, she has the credential of certified professional in learning and performance from the American Society for Training and Development. Uh, last but definitely not least is Beverly Gay McCarter. She's the principal of Human Mosaic Systems, and Beverly is an architect designer of 3D immersive virtual spaces. Her work focuses on the psychology of the avatar in virtual worlds the complexity of immersive learning spaces, as well as the impact of the aesthetics of 3D immersive environments on complex human systems. Her previous work um, has also included work for the National Defense University and the Smithsonian Institute. And behind the scenes, we'd like to acknowledge our organizer for, for tonight's event, Kay Novak. Kay is an instructional designer for Front Range Community College, organizer of the games-based learning MOOC. A MOOC is a massive open online course. She's also program chair for Virtual Worlds Best Practices in Education, chair elect for the ISTE Special Interest Group for Virtual Environments, and on ISTE's Mobile Steering Committee. So, Peggy, are you ready to talk to us a little bit about your experiences with WOW? Ready, willing, and able, Larry. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for uh, that great introduction. And um, I'm so excited to be here with all of my guildmates. For many of us, this is the first time we've virtually seen each other's real life persona. So it's really quite fascinating. Um, I think the purpose for me tonight is to um, pave the way. I'd like to pave the way for educators, for teachers, for um, those interested in starting to explore World of Warcraft as a learning platform. And in order to do that, I don't have the time um, to really go through a whole presentation. So I'm going to give you the basics of where you can find more information and contact information. Um, a little bit of the background, I think quite a few of us actually um, started out in virtual worlds before coming to massively multiplayer online role-playing games, um, specifically Second Life. And as you mentioned in my intro, um, in 2006, I established the first middle school. Uh, on the teen grid of Second Life and over the next few years brought 4,500 students through, trained about 60 teachers. We were doing every kind of um, standard-based curriculum in the virtual world and was fascinated at the impact that a student functioning as avatar had on their learning. Um, and I believe some, some of us are going to address that tonight. But the side product of all this was that I very often was asked to speak at conferences Curiously, when you are the first, you are the expert. So I was considered the expert for a while and really had to dance very fast to try to keep up with that label. And a lot of the conferences that, um, to which I was invited to speak were also gaming conferences. And initially, when trying to um, advance the use of virtual worlds for education, one of the biggest hurdles we had to address was differentiating virtual worlds from games because games had such a bad reputation. Games were what was sucking the brains out of our kids, um, keeping them away from true uh, educational tasks and true learning. And um, really, uh, we really found that we had to make that distinction because if you looked at a virtual world um, to the uninitiated, it, it appeared very similar to many of the games that, that kids play. But this then brought me to these gaming conferences and educated me about what are the differences between a massively multiplayer game and a virtual environment, where in the virtual environment it's a user-created experience, and with an MMO it's a game engine or a game mechanic that's functioning. Fast forward to um, a lot of the educators in Second Life were, were discussing these differences one night and just decided it was time. It was time for us to go find out what all this fuss was about um, through a very brief process that was almost uh, accidental, we ended up in World of Warcraft, and that's how the Cognitive Dissonance Guild was formed. And um, there were 12 founding members, 
and we now are proud to boast over 450 members. Now, many of them are alternate characters, but we do have probably 300 unique characters in Cogdis. So let my first function here this evening be to officially uh, in, invite you to join us. Um, you do not have to have gaming experience. We have players of every level. Um, the only requirement for membership is that you are in some way, shape, or form connected to education, but more importantly, connected to moving education forward and investigating game design principles that will transfer into your own practice. Um, secondly, I'd like to talk about um, where I ended up uh, with World of Warcraft shortly after entering it, and that was um, I actually met Lucas Gillespie, who is the uh, head of instructional technology at Penner County Schools in North Carolina, at a Games Learning and Society conference out in Wisconsin, a conference not to be missed if you can make it. And he and I kind of put our heads together and we're trying to figure out how we could get this into school because we, as educators, who had entered the game environment your teacher lens immediately kicks in and you see the learning going on. You see this beautifully scaffolded constructivist learning. And how could we harness that and bring it into school, especially with a platform that had the word Warcraft in it? So again, we, we knew we'd be fighting the hype. We knew that we'd be um, probably climbing some mountains to get this um, some level of acceptability. So what happened again, and I'm going to share my screen now, is we, Lucas Lawson, um, did the lion's share of this work. But they literally locked themselves in the closet <laughs> one, um, one summer, let me just get this correct here, and wrote the curriculum. And the curriculum, if you look at here in, in a poplet, um, this is a massive English language arts geared to eighth grade curriculum. So all of the um, standards that would be addressed in an eighth grade English, learn uh, English language course have been addressed in the WOW in School um, project. This is the wiki, and we'll put all these links in the, um, in the chat for you guys, and Kate will get them out to the YouTube. But this is where you would find anything you would need, including a PDF of the entire course with teacher notes, with um, rubrics with the actual quests, the standards that they are aligned to. And the reason we did this was because in our experience, teachers aren't sitting there saying, no, I don't think this is a good idea. No, I don't want to do this. No, this would never work. They're saying, what does it look like? Show me how. Model something for me. Give me a guide. So that's really what has been done here. Um, last year, we were um, very, very luckily introduced to 3D Game Lab out of um, Boise State University. And Dr. Lisa Dolly and Dr. Chris Haskell have developed this beautiful um, learning management system that is quest-based and was the perfect vehicle for the WOW in School project. So we moved what had been in Moodle into 3D Game Lab. And that's what basically the WOW in School Heroes Journey course looks like. Then our students contribute their work on their own guild site They've named their, their guild the Legacy, and this is where all their actual work is posted. So they're working in three arenas. They're working in, let me come back here, they're working in um, World of Warcraft, the game itself. They're working in the um, 3D Game Lab courses and creating their work in the Legacy. They're reading a companion novel. Um, we start with The Hobbit, and then later in the year we moved on to Beowulf. This is eighth grade, folks. And um, they're also keeping a real-life journal of their own journey as a hero. So what we've attempted to do in the WOW in School course is really change the culture of a classroom. My students aren't called students. God forbid you hear the words boys and girls come out of my mouth. My students are heroes. And I'm not their teacher. I am the lore keeper. And the beginning of the course itself, the very first thing that we insist upon is we tell our students that this is your course and we give them license, we give them agency, we afford them their own authority over their learning, they choose their own quest chains, they progress at their own rate, um, and we think those are all really vital components to why our students come into school every day eager, happy, and running into class, asking for more work over the weekend. Um, I could talk at length about it, but I wanted to give the resources. 
give you an overview of what we're doing, and then we'll have some time later for more questions or more information. Thanks, Larry. Okay, great, Peggy. Thanks a lot. And now, um, for those who want a little more information about how to join Cognitive Dissonance, um, right now we're not able to post a link to the YouTube chat, but we'll, we'll put that in when we uh, post the recorded webinar. And I'll give you an email right now. You could actually send comments and questions and, and requests for information to. It's gamesmook at gmail.com, G-A-M-E-S-M-O-O-C at gmail.com. And um, you'll be able to get more information there. Now, our second panelist is, uh, let's see, uh, is Melody Collier. Melody, are you ready to uh, talk to us for a little while? I am, Larry. Um, good evening. My name is Melody Collier, and I am the State and Federal Programs Coordinator in Holly, Texas. And tonight, I'm only going to talk to you a little bit about assessment in the game of WOW, and I'm going to do that through the medium of actually showing you um, what it looks like. We're going to complete some quests, and we're going to talk about uh, some add-ons, and we're going to look at the immediate assessment feedback a student would receive while playing the game. So I have a quest and it's called Bad Medicine and I need to get uh, seven jungle remedies, remedies. Excuse me. If I look at my quest log, it gives me a description of my quest. Uh, this is my criteria. Um, this is what I should be following and this is what I'm looking for. I need to obtain seven jungle remedies from the Curzon compound. Um, and so if I take my mouse and I toggle over uh, the enemy, a knife appears and lets me know instantly that that's a bad guy. And it says that I have two of seven of my remedies I am, I'm going to go over. So I'm learning the skill of stealthing and that is one of my uh, skills as a rogue. So at the same time while I'm um, learning my doing my quests. I'm also learning about my tune. I'm getting immediate feedback on whether or not uh, I'm doing it correctly. And some of the skills that I have while in stealth is sap. And so I'm going to learn to use my sap as well while I'm at this. So I'm going to go over. Here's my enemy. I can click on him and you'll notice that there's a little white dot that appears on my sap. I can hit him with sap. and it kind of knocks him out a little bit. I can sneak up behind him and I can use my next uh, sorry about that, use my next uh, uh, skill which is ambush and so I'm going to ambush him. I could pick his pocket first. Let's pick his pocket. That's a skill that I need to work on. So I picked his pocket. It gave me some wonderful loot. I'm going to ambush him and immediately I start attacking. I'm using my spells to eradicate him and he's dead so I'm going to pick it up and I notice I did not get a jungle remedy so therefore immediate feedback I know I need to do what go and find another enemy uh, I have another quest over here and it's to pick up um, dossiers uh, I'm not going to be working on that one currently for this time um, found me another enemy. He saw me. I'm going to kill him. Okay. And again, I did not get a jungle remedy. And if you'll notice down at the bottom of my screen, there's a blue bar. This is giving me instant assessment and feedback and letting me know, you know what, you're getting ready to level. Let's sneak up on this guy. I'm killing him. Again, we're trying to find jungle remedies. I leveled, okay. and this lets me know that I have cheap shots coming up. Let's try to get one more so that you can see what it looks like when you actually are successful in doing the quest. I have not been successful as of yet in uh, receiving the item that I need. Still. I have not been successful in receiving the item that I need. Again, there's the instant feedback, the instant assessment. Am I doing things correctly? Am I completing the quest as I need to be? Um, let's move on first uh, and look at uh, the, this is called um, recount. It is an add-on and it lets me know how I'm doing um, 
overall in melee, which is when I'm uh, hitting them with my knives, I says I'm at 48%, mutilate uh, 23, and mutilate offhand is 12. And you can scroll through and it will give you uh, different data for your tune and your character. Or you can just click on that specific tune and it gives you graphs and charts. So immediately I have assessment. Immediately I know how well I'm doing. Immediately I know that the majority of my um, my tune does the majority of their damage in melee. Uh, that I'm using using mutilate, uh, ambush, sinister strike, gouge. Those are some things maybe I need to work on. Um, my damage on them is not very high and neither is my percentage of use. Uh, Again, it, you look down here, it uh, gives you an idea on your hit, your crit, how time, many times you've missed, uh, different things like that. So again, I'm getting immediate feedback. That's one of the things that drew me to WoW um, as a teacher and an educator is the fact that you receive immediate, instant assessment and feedback. It's not a multiple choice test. It's not standardized testing at all. Um, it's actual immediate assessment. In life, we all know this. Assessment is immediate. Uh, it's not a standardized test. It's not multiple choice. And uh, you don't get uh, five or six times to go back and do it again. Um, that's one of the things uh, that, one of the reasons why I think WOW in Schools is such an awesome uh, project. And one of the reasons why I joined the Cognitive Dissonance Guild is so that um, I have the connection with other educators um, and we can discuss how you see assessment in the game um, every day. Again, sorry, lost my train of thought. You have the opportunity to um, to see how well you're doing. Uh, let students know if they're if they're using their spells correctly, and it's not in a negative form or a negative way. It's fun. Uh, we all know education uh, should be fun. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes it's not, <laughs> but we all know that it should be. And this. This really is uh, an excellent way of, of letting students grow and have success uh, without um, without feeling defeated. If you die, you die. Uh, you just go back and, and you do something different. Um, you you adapt and you improvise. Uh, if I am not in stealth mode, uh, you can tell he's going to see me right away. And if I just run in, he's going to attack me. That's immediate assessment in that, you know what, you really should have been in stealth mode. If I was a lower level character, he would kill me. Uh, and fortunately for me, I'm not. And I received a jungle remedy on that one. Again, instantaneous assessment feedback that I did something right, uh, that I did something um, positive. But at the same time, I feel good about myself. I killed him. I am completing my quest. I'll go and turn that in. I've leveled. It, it makes it really does make a difference in how um, how students interact with the curriculum, how students interact um, with education uh, overall. Uh, again, I, we have questions. Uh, we'll save those for later um, in the hangout. Melody, that was really Back great. To you. Melody, that was really great. And I think a little later we'll get into a little bit of uh, talking about how how assessment in game can possibly transfer to standardized assessments. I know that's a big issue for gaming um, in education, and I could go on and on about that right now, but let, let's get uh, to our next presenter, who is Chris Lukes. Chris, are you ready? I am ready. So, uh, basically what I use uh, World of Warcraft in gaming for is uh, I will use it to teach accounting as well as business, and my focus really revolves around uh, games, economies, as well as marketplaces. So in World of Warcraft, really what we're talking about is we're talking about a crafting system, and we're also talking about the auction house. So where I'm standing now, so let me mouse around so you guys can see, is I am standing inside the auction house. So I'll zoom out a little bit, and we have three auctioneers across the front that whenever you right-click on them, they give you access to the auction house. So they categorize everything. Uh, as a player, you can purchase, you can buy and sell. Uh, you can go ahead and put 
pretty much anything you want on. So it gives you uh, a tooltip here. So when you scroll over it, it gives you all the attributes. So this is the value added good uh, from business language. So we're looking at finished goods here and they sell them. So there is the auction house, which is the main uh, channel for selling in World of Warcraft. You also have informal trades. Some of you may have noticed some of the chat down in the lower left hand corner that's popping around. Um, you have people who are going ahead and putting information in there so that way they can go ahead and sell stuff uh, through informal channels. And the reason why they do that is just like in real life, uh, the auction house acts as a consignment shop. They take a percentage of everything that you sell. So it makes sense. If you're a manufacturer, you lose a percentage of your overall profit for that good because you're sending it out to retailers. Uh, we have retailing, we have wholesaling, uh, we have bartering, all that goes on in game. Uh, main currency is the yellow is gold, and then the sort of the off-color silver is the next metal, and then there's coppers. Uh, they all work in units of 100, so in other words, 100 copper equals 1 silver, 100 silvers equals 1 gold. Uh, gold is the total amount you have. Uh, you can go ahead and set up a standard auction house. You can either search existing auctions, you can create bids, or you can create your own auctions. And so with your own auctions, what you can do is you can simply take information that you have. You can go ahead and search for a glyph. This is an item that you can be manufactured. And it tells me this is how many people are, these are all the other sellers on the market. So just like you have in your standard marketplace, uh, everyone here is selling, it's competitive. Uh, the big difference here is in World of Warcraft, since all the crafters can pretty much make all the same stuff, with a few exceptions. Everything here is a commodity, so this is basically an introductory to a commodity-based market. Um, you have value added, but the value added is typically based upon uh, scarcity of resources, so uh, you have special items that drop uh, that are in limited quantity, so that's where your supply and demand comes in. And so we address that. We address uh, what is meant by basically an open bid system. Uh, what it, what it, that means is that every, we can see whenever somebody else bids against us, uh, we get a notification that, uh, that our bid is no longer the highest bid. So we can come back and we can, come, can compete. Uh, it is a blind auction because you can't see who bought, who's competing against you for that. There are some internal controls in the auction house, which again, I teach accounting, so internal controls are very, very important to make sure people don't commit fraud. Uh, so we talk about internal Internal controls. So, uh, example of internal control here in World of Warcraft is that the buyer, the seller, cannot bid against, cannot up the price on the buyer. Uh, really, you can't use any character that you have uh, from that account. Now, sneaky people uh, will go ahead, and we talk about ethics as well. Uh, if you're not an ethical uh, business person, you may have a secondary account uh, which you're paying uh, the subscription fee for, and you are going ahead and playing on that. So there's some complexity that is available in the market as well. So once we have an item, we simply just put it on the auction house. We can set a starting price. So we'll say 50 gold. And this is called undercutting. And so we talk about price competition. And we talk about the types of pricing that is out there. And then you create your auction. Now, the other thing we deal a lot with is I deal a lot with an accounting, so it will go ahead and we'll look at a specific manufacturing. So this is a profession called alchemy. This is creating uh, special potions and different things like that in the game. So when I click on an item, you see down below we now have what the item does. So this is the finished good. And then we see the, the raw materials. So in this case, it's Stormvine, Twilight Jasmine, and a Crystal Vial. So each of these have costs. So they can either invest their time uh, into uh, spending a profession that allows them to go out and pick these herbs and level up to the appropriate level to be able to pick these herbs, or they can buy them on the open auction house. And what I do with my students is my students document uh, what they're doing, whether if it's their time, they're documenting their time. If they're buying off the auction house, they're, they're documenting the purchase price uh, that they purchased for. And then they're creating financial statements and financial documents based on this information. And so this is sort of some of the things we're doing in, in game-based learning, especially in World of Warcraft. This is sort of examples there. I also use other virtual environments like Second Life and OpenSim. Uh, also sort of getting my, my dipping my toes into EVE Online and looking at that as another option to look at uh, business in these virtual environments because really what these do is they really allow you to have a very safe environment for the students. They're coming in here, they're not losing money, I'm not losing money, 
Uh, I may lose gold because I'll give my students some seed money to get them started. And, but that allows them to start their business and allows them to experience that entrepreneurial spirit in a very controlled environment where there really isn't a whole lot of, of you know, there isn't a huge, huge problem. They can't really get themselves in a lot of problems if they make a mistake. So it sort of goes along with uh, Czar's uh, discussion about instant assessment you're seeing in World of Warcraft. Is very, it's very apparent whether you are successful or not. You can, if you're tracking your cost, if you're tracking your sale price, you can easily determine are you making a profit or you're not making a profit. And we can discuss that. And the thing is, the nice thing about it is they're not, getting, they're not going into debt to do this. Uh, this is something that they can, we can talk about. This is something that we can have them create business plans based off of and have them basically try out new strategies, look at researching the idea. There's tons and tons of metadata out there on the economics of all these games, um, and it's called metadata. And you can go out there, and there's lots of different websites out there, and you can grab this information. You can actually do some economic analysis as well. So we really sort of cover the anywhere from the bare basics of going, you know, this is expense, this is revenue, this is a finished good, this is raw material, all the way up to going ahead and getting into more complex discussions like supply and demand, as well as looking at um, talking about consumer buying and marketing and selling and contracts. And so with that, I will wrap up and let someone else uh, take over. Wow, Chris, um, this is even more complicated than I've learned myself. That You can have a secondary account. Uh, is, there, is there like an SEC organization that's watching all of these activities <laughs> in WoW? There, there is not, actually. They're, they're more than happy for you to, to purchase as many accounts as you like because you, they, you pay the licensing software. You have to buy so the additional costs that are available. So, uh, and plus, you got to pay your wonderful uh, $14.99. And the nice thing about the the World of Warcraft is that some of that stuff is really, um, you know, sort of really averages out because you know, you got to remember on most of these uh, realms, uh, basically in World of Warcraft, they take all the players. There's, there was at one time 12 million players in World of Warcraft. Uh, since that time, they've gasped, lost maybe a million. So now on, there's only 11 million players uh, <laughs> globally. So and they're all split out across all these realms. So you're talking several thousand, you know, tens of thousands of people per each realm. And so they're all buying and selling. And so, so anyone who's really trying to manipulate the market is, it's still a relatively large enough economy that, that all that stuff sort of washes out. And so it might happen once in a while, but for the most part, all that stuff gets washed out. Okay. And just one little point of clarification before when you mentioned uh, what Czar was talking about. Czar is the in-screen name for Melody. Just for those watching who who don't know that little tidbit, but uh, I yes, I uh, unfortunately I have the bad habit of calling people by their by their screen names. So yes, that was what Melody was talking about. Totally understandable. So next we have uh, Deborah Bakken. She's going to talk to us about how she uses Wow and gaming in nursing education. Deborah, can you go please? Hi everyone. Um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about. Um, I don't actually use Wow for nursing. I use it more in a direct way, but I have to tell you that WOW has been my educator. My educator because the students that all of you are teaching that are coming up with all these games and these online environments, are with, they will very soon be my students of the future. And with higher education, it is going to more of an online education. Um, I what I've done with this is I've um, began to bring um, nursing into the 3D game lab and the 3D game lab has what they've done is a design that has implemented the same thing that WOW has implemented as far as a leveling system and so I can take instruction for my nurses and put them into um, a platform where um, instead of getting grades they will have um, maybe uh, timed components of an assignment that they would need to complete just like you were doing a level on a game in WoW. Um, they would complete those components, they would choose what they would like to work on and when they would like to work on it and um, at the end of that it would actually, they'd have to pass that level to go on to a new level. And that's basically the mechanics that you also see in WoW. 
Um, WOW has been my educator in a lot of different areas as far as the technology aspect of learning the voice chats, of learning the different medias. Um, and I can see that as a benefit to my students. Like I say, I'm just beginning with this as a new educator. I've been a nurse for many years, but I've only been teaching for the last six years. And um, right now, I'm still in school, and I'm working on um, n the strategies, the teaching and learning strategies. But in my view, um, these kind of formats are what an educator has to have to go on in the future um, for, for the learning that's needed, because it will be online. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Deb. Um, next up is Valerie Knoll. She's going to talk to us a little bit about gaming in adult and military training. Valerie, can you go ahead? Valerie, unmute your mic. That'll help, won't it? Yes, I'm Valerie Knoll. I'm known in game also as Amber Hawk and as Bellissima. Um, Amber or Bell for short, and I find that I actually answer to Amber as fast or faster than I do my real name. I'm going to talk to you for a little bit about professional development and about continuing education in the game. I'm going to bring up a PowerPoint, so you may have to bear with me for a second. I'm hoping that that shows. Larry, can you give me a little feedback on that? Yeah, we're still seeing your camera. Uh, okay. Share your screen. I did, but let's do it again. Share your desktop, I believe. Is what oh, you I see where I clicked wrong. There we go. There we go. Thank you. And now there should be a slide um, there with a logo and a chart. It may look kind of complicated. We've got it. Thank um, you. Okay, great. I um, I personally have found World of Warcraft to be an incredible source of professional development and continuing education for myself, and um, very much like Deborah has, I think. Um, what I've found is. World of Warcraft is a great place to learn about learning. It's a great place to practice teaching. Um, I've also found it's a great place to develop some of the foundation professional skills. My company, Crew Training International, you see our logo there, teaches a skill set to aviators called Crew Resource Management, or CRM. CRM training originated from a NASA workshop in 1979 that focused on improving air safety. The NASA research presented at this meeting found that the primary cause of the majority of aviation accidents, we're talking about crashing airplanes, was human error. And that the main problems were failures of interpersonal communication, leadership, and decision making in the cockpit. So crew resource management was the skill set developed to counteract those errors. In Crew Resource Management, or CRM, we teach that both technical skills and team skills are necessary to accomplish the mission successfully. Now, I personally believe that this is true for everyone, not just air crew. I believe that it's true in the medical community, in construction, in finance, um, and every day when you step outside of your house. So. To achieve your potential in your profession or even your life, you must possess both technical and team skills, and CRM focuses on those team skills. Now, here's, here's the connection. World of Warcraft actually requires these skills for success in the game. It is elegant in design because WoW builds these skills. It starts slowly, and as the challenge increases, the need for the skills increases. Uh, one example is that in the early levels, a new player will probably play alone much of the time. They need to adapt to an entirely new and different environment. And it takes time and um, lack of input from other people to do that. But as they play, they start to develop a sense of situational awareness. 
of interest also though is that by the time you reach the end content of the game when you're max leveled the challenge is absolutely incredible and it requires every single one of these team skills now these challenges this end content are called raids um, and I'm going to go through each of those team skills here for very briefly planning planning consists of researching the fights ahead of time online uh, we would do that through reviewing wiki content, blogs, uh, watching video explanations, um, and there's many resources online. Now, everyone on the team has a role to play. Um, one person failing to fulfill their role can uh, mean a wipe, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, it takes a lot of coordination and communication. As you can see here, there's a lot going on and a lot of information to take in and process. Maintaining situational awareness in this environment is challenging. There are many actions each person has to take, both defensively and offensively. Task management is critical, as is decision making. We wipe often. That's when everybody dies. The boss wins. Uh, we fail. And we debrief that. We talk about it. We figure out what went wrong and what we can do differently that might help us succeed. Now, the players themselves, in general, don't think about these skills. They just do what's necessary to win the game. However, I think Blizzard has done an incredible job of building game progression that fosters these skills and develops them. And we teach these skills where I work, but I don't have any relevant recent flying stories to support these lessons when we teach aviators. I do have relevant war stories, though, often from last weekend when I was participating in a raid with my guild. And most of our students, uh, most of the kids in the generation, um, early 20s, they know what a raid is, even if they're not gamers. And they seem to enjoy and relate well to my stories. So I find a, a, just an immediate benefit out of my play. But also, I do find that this supports my professional development. I believe my team skills are much sharper in my job as a result of my play. I believe I cope better with people's differences. I anticipate and recognize the impact of human error, and I can better counteract it. One of the very interesting things about these sorts of games is the avatar or the tune. Um, and here is one said avatar. When you look at this character, um, and just think to yourself for a minute, what are your assumptions about the player behind this character? Perhaps you have an assumption about their age about their level of education, about their gender. Just think for a second, what are your assumptions about this tune? Okay, this person, the person behind the curtain, if you will, is a 70-year-old woman who was raised in an abusive home where she learned that anything wrong was her fault. She held that belief well into her 60s. She was always very active, Hiking, bicycling, rock hunting, gardening, she always worked. When she was a stay-at-home mom, she sold Avon and drove school buses, and she was a Girl Scout leader. Her last job was as an engineering technician, learning computer-aided drafting and writing engineering documentation. She loved to work, her curiosity was unlimited, and she loved to learn. She multitasked like crazy before multitasking was even popular. And then she got very sick. She was chemically poisoned through no fault of her own and eventually had to go on disability. She suffered from a form of brain damage. She would take four hours to buy groceries, unable to make simple decisions or remember what she was in the store for. She also developed peripheral neural fibromatosis, a condition which causes her a lot of chronic pain every day. This woman went from being on the leading edge of the information revolution, being the person who taught everyone else how to use computers, to barely being able to manage her email and you know how fast technology is advancing. It absolutely just passed her by. This is Rain Shadow. This tune is my mother's tune. When I realized it might offer her some distraction from her pain, I got her subscription to Warcraft. I'll tell you now, it took her two years to level her first character to maximum. It was like we had dropped her off on a strange exotic planet. The simplest things were difficult for her. She had to learn how to use chat. 
She'd never had instant messaging in her life. This was the first time in her life she learned to use instant messaging in Warcraft. She had to learn again to pay attention to more than one thing at a time. She had to develop cross checks. She had to learn how to interact with the people in the game and that was a big deal. She was not a skilled player at first and people are harsh with their opinions and they hand them out very freely. When she started working with groups, she took a lot of criticism and most of it was not constructive. She had to learn to handle it. She gained skill, she gained confidence, and she learned. And her brain actually started to work better again. The incredible thing about all of this is not only did World of Warcraft bring my mother back to life, but this game has actually taught her social skills and behaviors she never learned before in real life. And it allows her to practice and improve those behaviors in a safe environment. For example, she has learned to work with the variety of personalities we find, and she has discovered that sometimes, after 60 years of this belief, sometimes when things go wrong, it is not her fault. For the first time in her life, my mother can actually handle unfair and harsh criticism without being injured by it. She may not be able to work but my mom's curiosity is still unlimited. She loves to learn. I've watched my mother blossom in the last three years in spite of her disabilities, in spite of life setbacks. She is fully herself. She is truly a beautiful person, and I love that the world can know her through Warcraft. I really wanted to share her story with you to demonstrate that World of Warcraft, or any game like it, really can be a venue for lifelong learning. Thank you. That's all I got. Wow, that that was so powerful. I, I can't thank you enough for sharing that very personal story of your mom. And, and I think that, you know, beyond the, the umbrella generic term of adult learning and adult training shows how personal and dynamic this environment can be in special cases and in helping people overcome uh, problems in real life. So thank you for that. That was very powerful. Um, and our last uh, presentation is from Beverly Gay McCarter, and Beverly has a little bit of a different perspective in that she works with complex dynamic systems and not really students, but she has excellent information for all of us. So, Beverly, can you take it away, please? Yes, thank you, Larry. I appreciate it. In fact, it's, it's very good to have me come in last because I'm going to be following nicely what everyone's been talking about. So, let me do what what uh, Valerie just did too and turn on my screen share so that you guys can see what I'm going to talk about today. So hopefully that's come up and you can see it. We're going to be talking about wicked problems and complex systems in WOW and let me go to the next slide. These are my background. Uh, I work, my, my company is Human Mosaic Systems. I've got an MS in Counseling Psychology and Human Systems, an MFA in Studio Art, and I'm certified in Virtual Worlds as an Architect Designer, and I'm also certified facilitator of self-organizing systems. While I worked at the National Defense University, I was helping to run the Federal Consortium for Virtual Worlds, and I helped train Pentagon leadership, the generals, in the application and use of virtual environments. Now, this page shows my books and articles and some of my awards most recently that are going on. The upper left-hand side book is the one that should be coming out in a few weeks, uh, Leadership in Chaotic Organizations. And now let's get on to the talk. So uh, let's look at what the complexity of human interactions is first. I'm going to make, this is a very fast talk, I'll give you a warning ahead of time, dealing with uh, complexity and, and wicked problems because we don't have a lot of time to go into depth with it. So let's look first at perspectives. Narratives, generally people think in terms of narratives as being storylines. Narratives are actually our individual and our group perspectives of how the world works. It helps us make sense of the complexity of the world around us. And if I go too fast with slides, please tag me and let me know, okay? Because we're hyper-connected via the internet, these very different perspectives on how the world works are bumping into one another, causing great innovation through collaboration and trade, or causing great conflict. Oh, I see my slides are lagging a bit with the screen. Are we on the slide that says, what is complexity? Can you tell me? Yes, we are. Oh, OK. Is it complexity? 
<laughs> Thank you. All right, so let's dive into it. Now, again, I'm going to give you a very brief, brief overview of it so we can get it to the WOW app applications. All wicked problems are complex systems, but not all complex systems are wicked problems. The difference is the social aspect. People are involved, and thus they make it a wicked problem. The most ultimate, succinct, intuitive definition of complex systems that I've heard is this one. A system starts to have complex behaviors, non-predictability and emergence, for instance, the moment it consists of parts interacting in a non-linear fashion. And another favorite definition is this one. A complex system is a system for which it's difficult, if not impossible, to reduce the number of parameters or characterizing variables, that means the parts of it that make it go and, and run, without losing its essential global functioning properties. This means you can't simplify it, you can't remove parts of it in order to try to get a handle on it, because when you do that, you change the very nature of the problem that you're dealing with. Two key elements of wicked problems are these. One is self-organization. And as you can see here in this chart, there are several examples. Flocks, schools, swarms, crowds showing human group dynamics, emergencies, for instance. The internet, uh, human interactions is another one. And this one, emergence. When due to the interaction of the individual parts, something new comes into being. It could be like crowd behavior, the stock market, again, our response in crisis for emergencies. So let's look at wicked problems. I love this chart. This chart, and you may want to zoom in on your screen so you can see details of it, it's the 2009 graph that General McChrystal did dealing with the counterinsurgency dynamics to try to stabilize Afghanistan. There is no part of this you can remove to try to get a handle on it to make it simpler. All of these dynamics are in play simultaneously. And this is a demonstration of a wicked problem. Wicked problems always occur in the context of human systems, reflecting the diversity of perspectives, paradigms, and views of reality of the individuals involved and, most importantly, their unpredictability. So, what does this mean for us today? Welcome to today. As you can see on this slide, the left-hand side, it lists all the different platforms, Web 2.0, 3.0, the Idea Agora, open source, all the way down to Pinterest, Twitter, Virtual Worlds, Moves, Mogs, and, and Moes. It's different perspectives, collaboration, interactions, and conflict, people networked globally, and all of this results in increased complexity. It's the conversation. It's people interacting, sharing information, self-organizing, emergence. This is all driving complexity, and as a result, this all impacts behavior, thoughts, and perspectives. So what is emergence? Why is it important? Again, it's the new entity. It comes into being when individuals group together, share ideas, perspectives, and views of reality, and it transforms what was into something new and into something different. Emergence can result in wicked problems. How all those different perspectives and views of how the world works either combine creatively for innovation or they collide for conflict. And there are three core dynamics at the heart of complex human interactions or systems. And these three dynamics continue to modify and shape each other as they work. And you're going to see as we continue with this talk, these same dynamics are in play and wow. Identity, information or the narratives, the stories that we, we, we tell in order to help us make sense of the world we're in, and the relationships we develop with others. So how are moves and mo's powerful and influential? How do they impact us? The physical world reality of human dynamics is found in the virtual world of MMOs and moves through presence and transference. 3D immersive learning environments mirror human dynamics in the physical world. As a result, that means they also mirror the wicked problems we have in the physical world. They impact us psychologically, behaviorally, and physically, and they enable complex systems. Wicked problems, therefore, are found in these live interaction environments, and it's important that these environments are designed with the living system of wicked problems in mind. Now, these are examples of the psychological implications, and because the mind readily expands into these environments, we're finding these applications for them. These include pain management, behavior modification, psychotherapy and cyber therapy, and, of course, the, the whole plethora of simulations and learning environments that are being used. 
The main design elements you find in MMOs that influence wicked problems are group dynamics, complexity, those unseen dynamics that have dramatic impact, and the team dynamics that facilitate collaboration skills. And these, of course, were mentioned by some of the previous speakers, as we were noting. It's been noted today also that critical thinking skills need to be taught. And project-based learning in groups is one of the very effective means of doing just that. Massive user virtual environments or moves are great environments for project-based learning. And from the theory of deterministic psychology, it's been revealed that there are three key elements for motivating learning. Their competence, the freedom to choose what you want to investigate or learn, and socialization. These fundamental elements are found in game design, particularly MMOs. So now let's look at wicked problems and complex systems as it relates to WoW. Again, you see the same chart. While an individual can practice on their own in solo questing, the guild can provide faster learning and a supportive environment. The guild becomes one's cultural perspective, group narrative. The skills one learns in the supportive environment and the guild can translate to greater success in developing relationships in the larger gaming community. Here we see greater detail. Here you can see the same living systems dynamic at work, the individual avatar or the tune's identity, and some of the factors that influence it in world. And these, of course, include making money through crafting items, rewards, requests, auction house, add-ons, social recognition through achievements, skills, rewards, items, knowledge that you have, sharing it on the wikis and the forums, engaging in the environment through exploration, the storyline, the challenges, skill development, status recognition. Competency, of course, with professional skills, class skills, raid skills, battleground skills, dungeon, team player, leadership skills. It goes on forever, and you can look in detail on the slides to, to see this. The guild provides information, and that information shapes our perspectives of how this world works. It's the narrative of the community. It provides support and group affiliation for the individual. This, in turn, enables the social world at large for us to be able to interact with as well, with more confidence and greater competency. The larger public interaction where our views of the other in many ways, different, many different contexts actually, impacts whether we collaborate with them or we find conflict with them. Now let's look at these dynamic interactions revealed away, and this is my last slide on, on this as well. Let's break it down to its dynamic complex interactions. The social wicked problems down at the bottom of the screen can impact whether you find collaboration or conflict in the game. This shows the dynamics also, this graph, of the three motivators we talked about earlier for learning and action. You've got competency, you have the freedom to choose what you want to do, and you've got socialization. So as your knowledge and skills increase, and we talked about this, of course, Amber a minute ago as well, your rewards increase, your reputation increases, and you can see this on the chart, all the lines show what's, what's being increased in the relationships with them. Your public and social recognition increases as a result. And all of this in turn influences your social interactions at large, your identity within the game, and to some extent outside the game. It influences our sense of self as well. For instance, if you look down at the narrative, the bottom left-hand side, the narrative is, is not just the story and you're learning the different pers perspectives of the different races and different factions within it, but you also have different classes within it. I can be a, I'm a hunter, for instance, in, in the game, where somebody else may be a, a druid or, or a rogue. And each of those have different skills, different capabilities, and different perspectives on how they interact in the world. This influences your identity. And there's a transference that occurs between the avatar and the self. So you're learning about the other perspectives, but you're also absorbing these perspectives. This influences your public recognition, it influences how you play the game, it influences how competent you want to become as well, and again, it builds your reputation, you get more rewards, and all of this comes back again to influencing the social side, what quests you engage in, the team building, the guilds you join, the, the raids you participate in, how you handle the dynamics of the raids, some of the people aren't very nice, some are incredibly helpful, how you end up bonding with the general community when you join in and community events. For instance, if you're in Stormwind and all of a sudden the horde <laughs> come to attack and kill the king, everybody rallies when it comes into the, the trade chat that the city is under attack. You bond with people. You, you feel the camaraderie. So again, 
all these complex dynamics are at play simultaneously. And this is why it goes back to the original quote for the session that was let off, that IBM and others would prefer to hire a guild master from World of Warcraft than necessarily a fresh MBA without the type of background. And it's because the players learned all these different skills. Again, thank you. And there's my, my avatar with my, my kitty. And my upcoming book that's coming out hopefully the next few weeks. We're in the final rounds of proofs on it. So it's Leadership a Chaotic Organization. And this is my contact information as well. Thank you very much, Larry. I appreciate it. Beverly, thank you very much. I, I, uh, I'm definitely going to buy that book. And a few of those <laughs> graphics are, are definitely on my, uh, my want list in terms of uh, explaining the dynamics of WoW and other gaming situations and how they can improve learning in a lot of situations. Now, we've been getting some questions in the chat session, uh, window, the chat window that is in the YouTube session. So I just want to remind viewers on YouTube that if you have any questions, please type them into the uh, chat box. And also, any Second Life viewers, if you have any questions, could you please type them in, and, and we'll try to answer them You know, in the next, we have about 28 minutes left in the session, if we go that long. Um, one question we got in chat, and, and I think I'll, I'll ask Peggy and then Chris to answer this first, and then anyone else can chime in who, who can relate, is how do you get WOW in schools? Beyond getting it unblocked from a technical perspective, uh, whose accounts are used, how did you actually get to use it in the school? Could you answer that question, please, Peggy? Sure. Um, I, full disclosure, um, my principal is in the guild. He's been playing well a lot longer than I have. So he knew about the learning that takes place. So I didn't have that hurdle. Um, the hurdles that we did have in terms of um, my school were um, purchasing things because, as everyone knows, WOW is not inexpensive. Um, we were lucky enough to have a little seed money from a video that my kids had uh, had created, and they won a thousand dollar a thousand dollars from the uh, contest that it, it was submitted to. And then I basically went to the PTA. Um, the head of the PTA at that time, it was just four years ago, um, was a very smart, very savvy gal. I sat her down. I showed her everything. I showed her the rationale. I showed her the learning that takes place. I showed her the curriculum. And she looked at me and she said, well, we're just going to tell them that we need software. <laughs> so, so that's how it got pushed through. But then, again, um, what I always tell schools who are uh, embarking on this journey is you, you start it in a, in a safe environment. You start it as an after-school club. And then you gather your evidence, whether it be anecdotal or actual da data. You, you gather that and you have that as the impetus to put in front of the decision makers who can then say, yes, you know, it took me two years before I actually had this inside the academic day. And last year, the first year that, um, that I had it inside the academic day was with the learning center population, who are the children who are in that special classroom, the special needs population. And it was so successful. Um, you know, the parents' feedback, everybody was so thrilled with it that people got wind of it, and then the gifted population started asking for it. And then the ESL population started asking for it because you know it, there's language there's literacy there's all these skills um so really what it was was baby steps it was um uh, handling the, the the cost and and again in in my presentation out on slideshare.net um all the um actual facts about what it costs what kind of bandwidth it uses these kind of technical problems it's all listed there it's all listed down on the wiki um but basically it wasn't this insurmountable problem that you would probably anticipate. What I was waiting for was the feedback from parents. Um, I was waiting for the pushback on, it's violent. Um, my kid spends too much time at the computer anyway. Um, and what you have to do is really be prepared for um, arm yourself with real information so that you can actually have the answers to that. You know, have the, have the uh, information from Henry Jenkins that disputes all of the myths and the hype about violence in video games. Have the information from James Paul G. about the learning that actually happens and why it happens and how it happens. Um, my colleagues and guildmates tonight were so eloquent. I was so impressed with, with all of their information. But from a, a practical standpoint, from the teacher, from the practitioner, um, you take those baby steps. You start it maybe as a small after-school club. Um, there's also 
alternatives um, that would accomplish the same thing that are free. You could perhaps use Lord of the Rings online with the WoW in School project. It's a no-brainer if you're reading The Hobbit, and that's a free MMO. Um, we're also going to be launching um, um, a, a not really curriculum-based, but um, I have now 100 free accounts for Portal. So we're going to be running Portal in school this year. Um, and what I found is the teachers, too, um, they're your biggest champions once they get it. And the way my teachers got it was the kids in WOW in school were starting to write so eloquently and so beautifully because they were so invested in their character and they had agency. And I would simply print out some of their writing, put it in the teacher's mailbox, and that would start the conversation. So again, um, be armed with information that, uh, you know, knowledge is power. So information is your, your best tool in getting the acceptance. And also, um, both Lucas and I have been uh, very vigilant about posting everything we possibly can out on the WOW in School Wiki so that you have it there. Um, we both, Lucas and I both also um, make ourselves available to anyone we, who needs us to Skype in with your school board or with your administrators to um, answer any specific questions to maybe um, ease the process along. Okay, thank you very much. And, and I think I think one of the main messages I got out of that is is that there is a lot of student improvement going on in many different areas and and probably the best thing you could do is be very cognizant about how their writing increases and, and how their other skills increase and use that as the motivator to get to get the pilot project off off the ground in the school. Would you agree? Actually, um, I would agree, but I think we have to stop being so worried about the three R's and the improvement in test scores and these kind of things, which, you know, Lucas has gathered data and, and it has shown across the board improvement. But I think more importantly, we have to recognize the hidden curriculum. We have to recognize all those skills that um, my guildmates tonight were sharing with you that are happening in middle school. The leadership, the collaboration, the socialization. And show me another situation or another um, experience that your students have in your classrooms that develops empathy, that gives children an opportunity to experience or to um, express empathy. Show me a standardized test that measures empathy. Really good point, really good point. We're gonna move on to another question because I think you've answered that one masterfully. Um, and this is a pretty uh, a quick and easy one. The, they're asking, are all the quests and storylines dark and violent in WoW? Uh, who wants to take that one? I can go ahead. This is uh, Chris. So um, really, it's a big mix. Um, this, uh, WoW is known for their sense of humor. Uh, Blizzard is the company that makes the, makes the game. And uh, so there's lots of different quests. They have holiday quests, uh, which are tied to world events, and they run the gamut of um, basically, you know, uh, winter holidays like uh, All Hallows Eve or Halloween. Uh, they have the Headless Horseman. They have different quests that are out there. Uh, they have a Santa Claus version uh, of things going on. They have Easter bunnies. They have a lot of different things going on. So not all quests are um, dark. Um, not all quests uh, revolve around violence. Uh, there is killing in the game. Uh, there's, there's, that's just part of it because that's the quest mechanic. Uh, the quest mechanic is you go out and it's also part of the hero's journey as well. You go out and you have to defeat some, some monster, some problem that uh, presents itself. Uh, so, so there is, there is violence there. Um, I do have, uh, there are some players who have decided that they, they aren't going to engage in uh, any quest that has them, uh, what they feel is unethical, so like having to steal something, uh, or something that uh, um, requires them to kill, so a lot of them they opt out of the quest game. And because World of Warcraft is such a huge game, you have a lot of these games within the game going on. Uh, for instance, there's lots of uh, players. There's, a, there's been a couple players out there who have gotten all the way from level one all the way to the 
uh, uppermost echelon of of their um, of the game, and all they've done is they've gone out and they've gathered herbs and mining, uh, and explored the world. Because you get experience points for checking out new places. You get experience points for uh, picking flowers. You get experience for uh, digging up uh, herbs. So there, I mean, there's uh, ore. There's different things that you can go ahead and do and to level beyond just following the quest line. Like for me personally, I don't do a lot of quests. Uh, we have other players like uh, Melody uh, who do a lot of questing. Uh, we have uh, some new players that are in our guild now who they just, they're just totally in love with the storyline of World of Warcraft, and they're just exploring all the different storylines that are out there. So, uh, so the answer is is that yes, there's a lot of fighting, there's a lot of violence in the game. Uh, it's it's basically animated violence. You really don't see a lot of blood. Uh, you really don't see a lot of of you know any gore or anything like that. Um, it's very cartoon. Uh, but, uh, like I said, I mean, it's there, but it's not the only thing that's in the game as well. Okay, great, thanks. Um, we have another question about how about using WoW for science, and um, I, I guess uh, Peggy or, or maybe Kay can answer that one, our magician in the background, or if you want to talk about Portal, what do I you actually, think? Before we move on to science, I, I've just got to get this out there about the, um, are all the quest lines dark and the violence, etc. Um, I, I challenge you to think of any great classical literature that is not dark or violent. Um, let's look at Shakespeare, look at Tolstoy, um, look at, look at the, the great books of our major religions. Um, these all contain violence, but what we need to understand is when a player enters a game space, they know it. They know that they are no longer dealing with the real world, they are in a game space, and that that does not transfer out to the real world. The studies have been done, the research is out there, kids know when they're playing, they know what's real and what isn't real. And we have to stop being so concerned about this, you know, um, are these, are, are these uh, interludes in World of Warcraft going to um, desensitize our students? No kids know it's a game. These are our worries, not our kids' worries. Very good point, um, and, and well noted. Now, in terms of uh, science and WOW. Um, I'm just going to jump in there. This is Kay, <laughs> um, the instructional designer from Colorado. I'm just jumping in here because um, where we think, we really think Portal another which is another game um, they're actually giving out free licenses for educators my community college just got 50 of them and I know Peggy's Peggy's gotten some too um, portal can be very physics based um, if you look at the games MOOC channel that you're currently on um, a couple weeks back we did a live broadcast where we looked at portal we had one of our, our former students who is now um, an astrophysics student at the University of Colorado Boulder he brought up portal and went through portal with us for for about 20 minutes um, there is a community out there using portal um, I would suggest that you type into Google learn with portal and take a look at that and right now the company that does the game portal there is an instructors or a teacher or student version and you can request licenses so if you're looking for science, not that I don't, that trust me, I'm an instructional designer. I think I can find learning in a, just about any subject in just about anything. But I would suggest looking at Portal. Can okay. I also address that question real quick? Go ahead, please. This is WoW. Um, there are lots of quests in WoW that actually involve uh, combining several different ingredients to make something else. So you could look at uh, chemistry uh, in WoW. Uh, also, alchemists are prevalent in the game. Uh, you make potions, you make flasks. Uh, there are lots of different things that you combine. A lot of higher level quests, I can think of several uh, in Vashir, in which you go out and you uh, gather the elements and you bring them back and you're making a potion, you're making a cure, you're making a, uh, you know, something that will go and uh, take away madness. So there are aspects of science uh, in WoW as well. Uh, but I agree with Kay, you would just have to know um, where to look for them, but they are there. There are actually some science 
requests on the uh, Wound School Wiki that other teachers have contributed. Um, one that I found very fascinating was they would send their students to different areas, and there, there are very diverse ecosystems in World of Warcraft. There's deserts and um, the, the fauna and the uh, animal life is fascinating. Um, but what they did was they sent the students out to different regions and said, find the errors. And the kids were coming back with things like, well, there were ferns growing in sunlight. So, I mean, they're, they're, you can find, you have to follow the learning. Once you're in there, and I, I can't stress this enough, that you have to go play. As a teacher, your teacher lens will kick in and you will discover the learning. Okay, anyone else on Science and Well? Okay, we're going to move on to one more uh, question, and actually this one I think Melody is directed to you. They wanted to hear a little bit more about immediate feedback. You had talked about that a little bit in your talk before, and it's apparently uh, piqued quite a bit of interest. So could you give us a little bit more on that, please? Uh, definitely. Um, you receive immediate feedback in the game, one, uh, if you're doing a quest completely. Uh, but to go back to the example, um, that she gave on rating. If the mechanics of your group are not uh, accurate, in other words, if you have people standing in a uh, fire, or if you have people that are uh, AOEing in a fight, uh, and if the fight says uh, you'll die, um, you're going to get immediate feedback. Your raid will wipe. Uh, there's a fight, in fact, uh, in end level rating right now in which you fight Deathwing and uh, he has tentacles that come out. On those tentacles uh, if you use AOE of any kind you will wipe, you will wipe your raid. Uh, he will enrage and everyone will die. Um, so that's immediate impact. Uh, everybody's like, oh, what happened? What happened? And somebody's like, oh, it was me. Sorry. I forgot I, uh, AOE. And AOE is area of effect, meaning that your spell does not only damage to Deathwing, but also to all the tentacles. So you're not only doing damage to one, you're doing damage to all. That's an AOE effect. Um, and that's immediate feedback. Uh, you know that whenever you go back in, I don't use an AOE spell. Uh, I can only single target. Um, again, a uh, while ago, I had three tigers on me and I died. Um, that's immediate feedback. I may be a level 27 now and they may be level 24, but that doesn't mean I can take on three at once. Um, my skill uh, on my rogue is not that high yet. Um, if I was on my other tunes, Zorasia, the Death Knight, a three on one would be no big deal. She's geared. My skill with her is better. Um, I know my spells, I know my rotation, um, I know what to do. So um, again, in those instances you uh, receive an immediate uh, assessment and feedback. Uh, you know um, picking pockets uh, is another example on my road. If I, rogue, if I don't do it right, they turn around and they attack me. If I do do it right, I get a reward. Um, there's lots of intrinsic um, motivation that comes from, um, from doing something right especially in, in kids, when they're successful. That builds that intrinsic motivation. And you don't always get a reward, uh, such as loot or anything like that. The reward comes from inside. And that, you know what? I did this. I know my spells. I, I know what um, move to use here. I know how to stealth. Um, and, and so, again, like I said, it, it, it really is. It's, it's, it's very impactful. Okay, thanks a lot for that. And, and talking about immediate feedback and assessment, this, this plays into one of, uh, one of my ongoing themes, uh, you know, since I work at the New Jersey Department of Education, when I bring up gaming and education, I'm always asked, well, show me the increase in student achievement, show me the increase in standardized tests, and Peggy, you alluded to this before about, about how the learning happens and how the skills increase, and, and um, the fact that in, in I guess what we could say is that what's happening is we're still using 21st century assessments to assess 21st century skills. I, I would venture to say that a gaming environment like WoW and other games teach students how to collaborate, how to um, work together as a team, how critical thinking skills, problem solving skills, teaches them self-esteem, teaches them um, confidence in themselves, and those are all very important real-life skills that aren't necessarily measured in a standardized way. And I'd like to see if anyone wants to comment on that. Uh, 
I, I'm sorry. I, I'm I'm going to hearken a little back to what to what Melody was talking about, but also address yours. Um, what I'm going to say, and and this is Kay. Um, what I'm going to say is that when it comes to to WoW and any kind of game, what we're really looking at is we're looking at at the accomplishment, the hard fun. And, and there's an actual term that game designers use that, that's called Fiero, and, and Jane McGonigal has been popularizing this term. But what, fear, but what Fiero is, is exactly that fist-pumping moment, that moment right after you've worked so hard on something and you've accomplished something, that point of Fiero. And that and that's the accomplishment point. And and I'm sorry and I'm sorry, Larry, when it goes back to your standards, I don't know any assessment tests that the kids are taking these days that show that. I don't know any of the kids who are finishing that test, pumping their fish and going, I have accomplished something. I have done something meaningful. I have learned something. So until our assessments do that, and I honestly believe Melody could probably figure out an assessment that could do that <laughs> at some point in time. I think until that, I, I'm I'm not sure we can just I'm not sure we can answer what you asked. And I'll get off mic now. Then I'd like I, to jump in here and, and and piggyback a little bit on what Kay just shared. Um, in that whole process, we need to talk about failure and how failure is dealt with in school. Now, when I was developing my presentation for, um, for the ISTE conference this year, the first group that I practiced with was my students. And one of the things they said was, well, why do you have a whole slide on failure? And I said, well, let's talk about failure. And I said to the kids, okay, you, you just got a, your report card and you got a 69 in math. What does that mean? And collectively, the whole group of them went, fail. And then I looked at them and they said, well, what should it mean? And they kind of sat there and looked at me like scratching their heads and wondering what I was getting at. And I said, what should a 69% mean? And the answer is that means you have mastered 69% of the content. You need to now master the rest and you will start at point 69. That's not how we handle it in school. In school, a 69 means you fail. And what do you do? You start over from the beginning, usually in the summer when you really don't want to be there. But how is this handled in World of Warcraft? Failure is not only an anticipated but a respected part of the cycle of play. You expect to fail because it's part of that feedback and it's how you learn. So if we could take a page from WOW and bring it into school about the whole way we perceive failure, you know, um, I think it would serve us well with or without games in education. I would just like to say I agree with Peggy um, and to address your question about standardized testing. When students are successful in one medium, that success, it spills over into, into other mediums. And I think a lot of time, and along the lines of what Peggy said, in school, at least public education, um, we hold up and ridicule failure um, to a horrible degree. We don't celebrate enough uh, of the fact that, like she said, they you know they mastered 69% of the content. That's significant, and and yes, it is in you know in school a failure, but really in actuality it's not. Uh, and that's one of the other aspects I like about the game. When we fail, we come back and say, okay, what do I need to do different? Uh, how can I improve? It's not a bad thing. Uh, like it is in education, and I, not, I really think standardized testing plays into that, um, it, into the educational concept that failure is a bad thing, because as schools and as school districts, speaking from the school district perspective, if we fail, we're it's horrible. We lose funding, we lose money, um, and I mean I hate for it to come back to that, but that's what it comes back to. So, in my opinion, public education standardized testing, uh, teachers in general, administrators could learn a lot from an hour in WOW every day or every night or every weekend, whatever they can afford. I guarantee you if they would get in there, their, um, their attitude would change. That, that, that's, sorry, soapbox. No, I, I totally agree with you and I think everyone else does. And 
And I'm trying to remember, I think it was Malcolm Gladwell in, in one of his books, he did a study and found that, that um, students who fail and learn to overcome failure in the long run are much more successful in life than those who never face adversity, never learn how to overcome obstacles and how to pick themselves up and keep going no matter what. And that's a very important skill that students learn in gaming. And I think that transfers across every activity of their life, whether it's academic or, or whether it's uh, real life, their career, their, their, their social skills, and uh, their success as citizens and, and people of the planet. Um, we only have about four minutes left. So I'm gonna give everyone 30 seconds if you'd like to make a closing comment. And uh, we'll go in the same order. Peggy, you're on. Well, I guess I would just like to restate my invitation to join us in Cognitive Dissonance. Um, we'll have that information posted for you in multiple multiple uh, locations, but particularly in the game's MOOC. And um, we are on the Sisters of Elun server. We are Alliance. However, we do have a sister guild on the Horde side. And um, come and learn with us. Learn to game and game to learn. We look forward to seeing you. Okay, Melody? I would just like to remind you that authentic assessment is not a multiple choice test. Authentic assessment comes from lots of things. Success, failure, overcoming adversity, obstacles, collaboration. And an hour and well, and a lot of teachers would be able to identify authentic assessment in their classrooms better. So come join us, have a good time, and uh, you know, maybe you'll get to raid with us. Thank you. Chris? I basically just say come, have fun with us, uh, learn, play, and see how it uh, adapts to the subject that you're playing. And just remember, as the, as the instructor, as the educator, when you're, de when you're delivering these games, really your big, uh, big focus on you is providing context. You're providing the context and the framework for which your students view the game. Thanks, Chris. Deb? Oh, hi, thank you. Uh, basically, the 21st century is all about complexity, ever-changing environments, and I know you jumped <laughs> in a world of Warcraft, especially in terms of the, the battleground that's unscripted. Again, the players have to know their skills, they have to know their abilities, they have to be flexible, they have to be adaptable, they have to be able to strategize in the here and now, in real time. They have to anticipate and they have to respond in a very flexible manner. These are all skills that translate to learning in the 21st century in the classrooms as well. So it's a, it's a great environment and I encourage everyone to start to game. Thank, Thank you, Larry. Beth. Thanks, Beth. Uh, Deborah. Um, yes, I'd just like to add that also um, our teachers that fail at something are, are the ones who excel at that subject. And so in WOW, um, there is no shame. We help each other out. It's a wonderful learning experience, and I hope you join us. Thank you. Oh, I was on mute. Valerie. <laughs> oh, um, you know, I'm going to second what everybody said. Please come join us. Come try it out. The best way to learn about these things, these all of these new social media tools, all of these games, uh, massively multiplayer online role-playing games, the best way to learn about them is to just immerse yourself in them and try them out, and we'll help you get the most from that experience. Okay, we're going to close up the webinar now, and I just want to thank our panelists. I think we had a, a, an incredible diversity of experience and information, and we will be posting this on the same link that uh, you use to get to the YouTube live event uh, as a recording, and we'll also be augmenting it with clear graphics and pictures. And if you have any questions about how to get in game or any other comments, please email them to the following email address gamesmook at gmail.com, G-A-M-E-S-M-O-O-C at gmail.com. And I just want to thank you for, for watching and attending, and I hope you join us on this journey on how we can use these new technologies and gaming environments to help our students learn and be successful in the world. Thank you very much, and good night.